Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, well, first of all, thank you to Professor Hoppe and uh, to Dr. Gülcan Hoppe for inviting me and uh, hosting this conference in these beautiful surroundings. Um, I'm very honored to be here at the Property and Freedom Society, uh, which I've followed for many years, uh, ever since I was an undergraduate student in economics in Berlin. And uh, to be here personally uh, for the first time uh, really has in many ways exceeded my expectations, especially the food. <laughs> but not exclusively the food. Um, when I picked my topic uh, for this talk, I um, came up with the provisional title, uh, which was different. Um, it was The Menace of Inflation, Admission and Denial. And I picked that title at a time when the price inflation rates in the Eurozone uh, went up sharply, and uh, the authorities at the ECB and elsewhere rather desperately tried to reassure the public that this was only transitory. Uh, nothing to worry about. This is, is transitory. It is because of um, problems related to the lockdown recession and then the war in Ukraine. It certainly has nothing to do with monetary policy. Um, by now, this has changed. Uh, the narrative has changed. Basically, nobody claims anymore that this is a transitory phenomenon. Um, everybody admits that uh, the higher inflation rates are here for a while, at least. Um, and in fact, is, it is now the official goal of the ECB not to return back to 2% price inflation as soon as possible, but rather to do it smoothly in a gradual process, year by year, step by step. We had 8% this year. Next year, we might have something like 6 or 7%, then 5 And eventually, we go back to 2%. Um, whether this will work out is highly questionable. Uh, only recently, the uh, Kiel Institute for the World Economy has published the inflation forecasts for next year, and they estimate that inflation will actually be even higher next year than it was this year. So um, given all that, I thought it is not really necessary to, to talk too much about these public discussions uh, of inflation. Um, because we all know that uh, there are many problems related to this. Instead, um, I wanted to look at some more fundamental problems uh, with the official inflation measures, and hence uh, the new title, A Critique of Inflation Measurement. Um, and I would like to start this uh, providing some um, motivation in fact, having listened to Torsten Pollard, who, who criticized the role of the empirical economist, this is very fitting because I want to do a little empirical exercise. <laughs> yeah. So um, this is the money stock M1 in the euro area, um, plotted as an index. So uh, the final quarter of 1998 is the base quarter where the index takes the value of 100. And then you can see over time how uh, the money stock M1 has uh, evolved uh, throughout the existence of the euro. Of course, it was introduced in 1999 as an accounting currency. And uh, M1, uh, by the way, is uh, the cash money in circulation as well as the money on regular bank accounts. So for the layperson, that's what we consider to be money, or that's the money that is readily available to be spent on goods and services. So um, it makes sense to look at M1 when we think about inflation. Yeah, and you can see, OK, over uh, a bit more than two decades, um, the money stock M1 has increased by a factor of larger than six, or uh, compounded by more than 500%. You can calculate the uh, average uh, annual growth rate, which would be about 8.5%. And in a traditional sense, in a classical sense of the word, this would be a measure of inflation. That's the expansion of the money stock at, uh, on average, 8.5% uh, per year. Of course, we, when we talk about inflation in the modern context, mean price inflation. And it is very instructive to look at how price inflation compares uh, to the evolution of uh, the money stock M1. And here we have the harmonized index of consumer prices, which is the conventional measure of inflation in the euro area, and it has grown by comparison uh, 
on average, only by 1.7% per year. So now this in and of itself doesn't mean that the index is, is wrong or anything, although it is wrong. Um, <laughs> but uh, there are, of course, other factors that come into play that could explain away some of the excess money production that we see here in the graph. For example, economic growth. Right, to the extent that you have real economic growth, uh, the additional money that is created can be absorbed without unit prices of goods and services increasing. Um, however, if you look at economic growth, it has been uh, rather weak. Uh, I take out here the lockdown recession, and if we take out the lockdown recession, then per year real GDP in the euro area has increased by 1.6% per year. So now if you make a back of the envelope calculation, you can see uh, that price inflation as measured by the HICP and real economic growth uh, do not correspond at all to, um, to the rate at which the money stock has expanded. So the money stock on average increases about five percentage points faster than the HICP and real GDP put together. And this is really an explanatory gap, right? We have to think about uh, where does the excess money go? If it doesn't push up prices, if it is not absorbed by real economic growth, where does it go? And uh, there are different explanations for that. Yeah? One uh, typical explanation that economists um, like to give is, um, well, there should be a correspondence between uh, the growth rate of the money stock and the growth rate of the HICP and the real GDP only in so far as other things are constant under the Ceteris Paribus consumption. But Ceteris is almost never paribus. And so one thing that could have changed uh, over the time is the demand for money. Uh, to the extent that the additional money is simply held in cash balances rather than spent on goods and services, it won't push up prices. So the HICP is not necessarily downward biased. Um, if indeed the demand for money has increased to such a large extent year by year. Um, if you think about it, this is very implausible. You would, if anything, is expect uh, the reverse to happen. If you are in an, in an inflationary environment where prices go up and even if only at 2% at a relatively moderate rate, you would expect people to reduce their cash balance demand for money and rather spend the money faster. Um, so mainstream economists would call this the velocity. Yeah? Uh, they would argue, yeah, uh, partly this can be explained by a decrease in velocity. The money circulates at a lower pace in the economy. And at the inception of the uh, euro, um, the euro system estimated that there would be such a decline in the velocity of about 0.5% per year. Now, if you take that, okay, let's run with the estimate of the euro system. 0.5% does not at all explain away the gap of five percentage points that we have seen in the previous slide. And even if you increase that to one or two percent, which is again uh, rather implausible, uh, it doesn't explain away the gap. And this uh, brings me to the second possibility, and this is of course uh, the hypothesis that I want to stress here in the talk, the HICP is underestimating general price inflation. That is downward biased. Um, and another piece of suggestive evidence um, can be found in some survey data that is compiled by the European uh, Commission uh, since 2004. They ask people in the euro area about their perceived uh, price inflation, about the inflation perceptions. And if you calculate uh, the median of this perceived inflation, which is plotted here in red, you can see that it is persistently above the official inflation measure. And uh, interestingly, it is on average about five percentage points <laughs> above, above the officially measured price inflation. Now you might say this is a coincidence, <laughs> or is it? Um, but we here at the Property and Freedom Society are very fond of the wisdom of the crowds, and so we take this very seriously. If the public says 
um, the inflation is really five percentage points higher, there might be something to it. Um, now, and this brings me to uh, the important uh, theoretical uh, problems that are related to the uh, HICP. Um, if we accept that second explanation to play a significant role, uh, then we have to ask, so why is it then that the HICP is underestimating general price inflation? And then, if you think about it, there are basically two possibilities. So it might be the case that there is overproportionate price inflation uh, outside of the HICP basket. So the HICP tries to measure consumer prices, uh, prices of consumer goods and services, and it doesn't look at other markets. So it leaves things out in the economy. And maybe in these uh, areas, in these markets that are left out in the HICP, there is an overproportionate amount of inflation going on. Um, the second uh, possibility is that the HICP is indeed downward biased in what it attempts to measure. It measures uh, consumer prices um, and it has an inbuilt downward bias in the construction of the index. Uh, and uh, I would argue that there's a very potent mix of both of these factors at play um, that uh, can show or explain why the HICP is uh, indeed too low, is underestimating general uh, price inflation. So let us uh, look at the first uh, point here potentially overproportionate inflation rates outside of the HICP basket. Um, the HICP, as I mentioned, focuses on consumption goods and services, and more precisely, it focuses on private consumption, and even more precisely, on private present consumption. So the only thing that matters for the construction of the HICP are consumption goods and services that are bought by private individuals in the present. So two things are systematically excluded from the calculation of the HICP. The first thing are so-called public goods. Um, we could call that state consumption. Yeah, expenditure by the government is excluded. All of the things that the government buys, um, infrastructure, expenses for education, for health, security, and so on, all of that is not included in the HICP. Uh, it is true that the HICP has, for example, a sub-index for education and for health. Uh, they have a weight of 1% and 5% respectively in the overall index. This is, of course, from a perspective of the economy as a whole, uh, too small a weight. Because as a society, we spend much more on these things because of the uh, government spending that, that goes on. Right? What the HICP uh, considers is only the private part of expenditure on education and health. So public goods are excluded, and there is potentially an area where we have overproportionate inflation. Surprise, surprise. Um, the second element are future goods. So that means saving is excluded, um, and saving is nothing else than the provision for future consumption. As the HICP focuses, focuses only uh, on present consumption, any future goods are excluded in the index. So all assets that you can imagine, stocks, real estate, uh, land, and so on, gold, Bitcoin, um, are excluded uh, in the index. And this is problematic if you think about the HICP as being a, a general inflation measure. You would believe that it takes also account of some of the future goods that are important for the general or average household, right? The households are not only uh, consumers in the present, but they are also savers uh, for the future. And they try to provide for future consumption, at least to some extent. And so if you want to analyze the general standard of living or things like that, you might think that future goods uh, are something that we should take account of. Now, um, it is indeed the case that in all of these areas, if you take the available data, 
uh, you find overproportionate rates of price inflation. So here, this is data for Germany for the same time period that we looked at before. The average uh, HICP price inflation in Germany was 1.6%, um, so a bit lower than the e uh, Eurozone average. And if we compare that to, for example, uh, stock price inflation, as measured by the German uh, stock market index, the DAX, we see that, well, there's a big uh, gap on average. Yeah? On average, uh, stock price inflation was 5.2% per year. And it is, of course, very volatile. That's a particularity of, of, of stocks. Uh, but on average, and that's important when we consider this rather long-term perspective, on average, uh, the price inflation in stocks is much higher. So now you might argue, okay, this is because of economic growth and the uh, businesses make um, product productivity gains or the expected profits go up, and that's why the stocks go up. That's rather a sign of health. Um, and I would uh, hold against that just the observation that, for example, during the lockdown uh, recession, uh, the DAX has increased by 5% per year. Of course, it has gone down initially, but the monetary expansion was so strong that uh, stock prices were pushed up again very quickly. And so it's hard to believe that this is due to productivity gains. Yeah? So it is primarily driven by, in, by monetary inflation, and that's why it should be taken account in the measure of, of price inflation as well. Um, the second uh, element that I would like to show you are real estate prices or uh, uh, residential uh, property prices. In Germany, over the entire period, they have increased by 2.6% per year. Uh, in the first half of the period, um, the inflation rate when it comes to real estate was uh, low in Germany. That's a particularity of Germany. If you look into other countries, take France, Spain, uh, Italy, Portugal, uh, of course, there you have massive amounts of uh, uh, price inflation in real estate markets. In Germany, this has only started after the Great Recession and with the um, beginning of unconventional monetary policy measures. Since then, if you take the second half of the period, the average rate of inflation in real estate markets is, is about 4.5% uh, in Germany. Uh, so also overproportionately high. And uh, the last uh, element that I want to show to you uh, are public goods. Now, the problem with public goods is, of course, that uh, there are no market prices for public goods, so it's very difficult to, to directly uh, calculate an index, a price index for public goods. But what you can do instead, what you can use as a proxy, are, of course, the costs of provision. Right? And what does it cost uh, to provide uh, public goods? Well, it's tax money. Yeah? The tax revenue of the government uh, is uh, the price the public pays for all the public goods that the government uh, spends the money on. And if we look at the tax revenue in Germany, we can see that, well, here, too, we have an overproportionate development. Right? The tax revenue has increased as, at a faster rate than the general price inflation rate. So the tax burden of the average household in Germany has increased over time. Public goods have become uh, more expensive uh, over time in relative terms, when you compare that to the general rate of price inflation. Um, and this is not taken account of the quality of public goods. Yeah? Now, um, so this, all of these um, empirical facts um, show that indeed there are blind spots of the HICP that uh, when we would take account of those, we would end up uh, with a much higher uh, assessment or estimation of the general rate of price inflation. So part of uh, this a gap that I've shown you can be explained away if we were willing to, to take a broader uh, index of, of inflation. Now, this is independent so far of uh, an inbuilt bias in the HICP. Now, that's the part that I want to talk now, uh, that I want to talk about now. There might be an inbuilt bias in the HICP in that it underestimates the rate of price inflation for consumer goods and services, of course. Uh, and uh, there are good reasons to believe that. Um, there's an extensive literature on, uh, on that topic, on the potential biases of price indices. It goes back uh, more than 100 years. Uh, but an, an important contribution in the modern context was uh, the work of the Boskin Commission uh, that published a series of papers in the mid-1990s 
and they found uh, an upward bias in the consumer price index for the United States. And very similar um, uh, studies were published for other countries, for Germany, for example, and for France, and they found the same results. There's an inbuilt upward bias in uh, the consumer price index as they were used at the time. So uh, these uh, findings uh, led to changes in the methods of calculation, uh, which I want to explain now. Um, the first uh, source of this supposed uh, upward bias are quality changes in the goods and services included in the basket. So the Boskin Commission argued that um, the statistics do not sufficiently take account of quality improvements in the product. Um, so if you have a good that becomes more expensive, but at the same time, for whatever reason, there is an increase in the quality of the good, then this price increase is not necessarily a sign of inflation, but rather you should reduce the observed price by the equivalent uh, of the quality improvement measured in money. So you reduce the observed prices and you end up with a lower inflation measure. Uh, and, and this argument, uh, the Boskin Commission argued that about half a percentage point is due to uh, uh, quality changes. This led to a more explicit quality adjustments in the goods included in the HICP. And uh, when you take a look at the website of the German Statistical uh, Office, the Federal Statistical Office of Germany, they list uh, nine types of quality adjustments that they use. Uh, the most famous uh, one are the hedonic quality adjustments. Those are quantitative regressions where they estimate the money price or the price equivalent of a quality change and then they deduct that from the observable price. Um, but my favorite are the judgmental quality adjustments. And I found that absolutely outrageous that they list that on their website. They say, and I quote uh, loosely or paraphrase loosely from the website, they say that in cases where the quality change cannot be objectively quantified, it might be up to the expert to just make a judgment of what the money equivalent of the quality improvement is. And so they engage in discretionary price adjustments um, and do not take uh, the raw data, the raw price data as they observe it. Um, the big problem here, or one of the big problems, is that there, there is no transparency in terms of the data. You cannot find the raw data before quality adjustments. Um, you only have the data after quality adjustments. And even there, you don't find all the data. It's not uh, publicly available. Uh, we had a meeting, a colleague of mine and I, we had a meeting with uh, employees of the German statistical office. And uh, we asked them, OK, can you give us an example of where you uh, correct for a quality improvement. And they were like, sure, yeah, here, computers, mobile phones, all of that, yeah. Constant improvements, we correct the prices, of course. Okay, wonderful. Uh, can you also give us an example of where you take account of a potential quality deterioration? Dead silence. Th they couldn't give us an example. I mean, uh, this, is, uh, <laughs> this is scandalous, right? Um, but when you think about it, this is also not all that surprising. Of course, when you have quality improvements, any business would openly advertise that. Well, yeah, the computer has uh, gotten faster uh, and, and so on. Yeah, If there is a quality improvement, you are open about it. You make it public. You advertise it. So it's very visible. It's easier to take account of that. When there are quality deteriorations, which also take place, arguably, uh, those are hided. Yeah, there there's an incentive for businessmen to hide the quality de deterioration so they are not as easily uh, observed. And so this whole enterprise of trying to uh, correct for quality adjustments comes with an inbuilt bias towards only taking account of the quality improvements which reduce the inflation measurement but leaving out the quality deteriorations in the product which would increase the inflation measure. The second uh, point are substitution effects. Um, so the economists uh, in the Boskin Commission observed, surprisingly, that people change their consumption behavior over time. There are changes in the consumption pattern. 
And it so happens that the goods that are replaced have a relatively high rate of price inflation, and the goods that are come in to the uh, actual consumption basket have a relatively low price inflation rate. And so the economists and the statisticians argued, well, we have to adjust the basket over time, right? We have to adjust the weights. If people stop buying the goods with a relatively high price inflation rate, and instead buy the goods with a relatively low price inflation rate, then we should adjust the weights. We have to give a higher weight to those goods that they now actually consume, which just so happens to be uh, the goods with a relatively low price inflation rate. And of course, the, it, this is exactly what has been done in the US and in, in Europe as well. Uh, the HICP is nominally a Les Paris index. Um, on their website, they say it's a Les Paris type index, which is actually more accurate because it's not really a Les Paris index anymore. The Les Paris index works as follows. You take a base year, you fix a basket, and you do not change the basket, and then you observe how the price of that basket evolves over time. That would be your inflation measure. What uh, the statisticians in, involved in the calculation of the HICP do now is they update the basket every year, okay? Um, following the arguments of the Boskin Commission. Now, this is problematic, um, and this has partly been pointed out m almost 100 years ago by an Austrian economist, Gottfried von Haberler, in his habilitation thesis. This is problematic from a welfare economic point of view because it might not just be a genuine change in preferences that makes, is, is, um, is the cause of the change in consumption pattern, but it might just reflect, these changes in the consumption pattern might just reflect a strategy of avoiding higher costs. Yeah? People buy those products with lower price inflation rates not because they intrinsically value them more now that preferences have changed, but just because they are cheaper in relative terms to those other goods that are more expensive. And if that's true, then of course, um, the quality of the overall basket deteriorates because of that. Now, in, in, in that way, it is linked to, to quality changes. Yeah? But the quality changes in the statistics are not made on the level of the overall basket, but only on the level of individual goods. So if the quality of the basket changes, no adjustments are made. Yeah? So to take an example, instead of buying at uh, the organic uh, food store, you go to the cheap chain supermarket where prices have remained relatively low. Um, and in the statistics, that reduces the price inflation rate. But of course, it also reduces, arguably, the quality of the products you get. Yeah? And if you were to correct that, price inflation would be higher. So. Uh, what I want to argue here is then that the reactions to these initial uh, uh, upward biases in the HICP index, if they existed at all, are very likely to have turned these biases into downward biases and um, make us now underestimate the general rate of price inflation with the HICP. Okay, so uh, the final question, of course, <laughs> might be, um, well, do we need uh, measures of price inflation? Um, my answer would be not for monetary policy. Yeah? There's actually um, a big problem that monetary policy uh, has focused on a nebulous uh, construct like a price inflation index in order to um, uh, manage uh, the, their monetary policies and their monetary expansion. Um, in fact, of course, I don't have to tell you that I'm talking to a libertarian audience here. The ideal would be not to have monetary policy at all. But if you have monetary policy, then you would want to, and you want to have a rule so that policy is not discretionary, then you want to have a rule which is pretty much objective um, that uses uh, variables that are measurable, clearly measurable, without much doubt. Um, and the price inflation index certainly does not work, and uh, especially the one that is used today. Yeah? Um, and it is responsible 
um, for, uh, in my opinion, an overexpansion of the money stock because the consumer price inflation as measured by the HICP has not reacted much to the tremendous uh, expansion of the money stock that has been going on. Remember, a factor of six over two decades. Um, the actual inflation that was going on outside of the HICP was, was not uh, actually taken into account, and the official measure gave a pretext for continuing the monetary expansion. And, and all of the uh, adverse effects of that are, of course, amplified. Um, nonetheless, I would say it is important to think about how we could potentially improve uh, an inflation index uh, we don't need it for monetary policy, but it still is very informative when you engage in economic history in the Misesian sense, for example, um, in order to assess uh, the development of real wages, um, standard of living, and so on. Yeah, that is still informative, although there are many problems and we cannot objectively measure it. Um, I, would, uh, I, I believe that if we were not only... Uh, uh, get rid of monetary policy, but altogether get rid of um, um, of public statistics and instead privatize uh, the measurement of inflation, we would get much better inflation measures that are much more informative and would give us a much clearer view on what is going on in the economy. And with that, I close and thank you very much for your attention.